So I thought we got off to a great start, uh, given the fact that our um, first speaker was 14,000 miles away. Um, so our second speaker is Teva Regal. Uh, Teva was raised in the Orthodox Church and has been an active member for all of her life. For many years, she was involved in the work of youth ministries in the church, working on the national level of the American-Romanian Orthodox youth and serving two years as the national president. During much of this time, she also worked in campus ministry, organizing and coordinating various Orthodox Christian fellowships. For the past 20 years, her work has focused on the ministry of women in the church. For over 15 years, she served as managing editor of the St. Nina Quarterly, a publication dedicated to exploring the ministry of women in the Orthodox Church, and one which aimed to cultivate a deeper understanding of ministry in the lives of Orthodox Christian women and men. She now serves on the board of the St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess. In addition, Teva has served as an Orthodox consultant for a number of consultations on women and men in the church sponsored by the World Council of Churches. A lifelong student of theology, Teva completed her Master of Divinity at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in 2007, graduating with highest distinction. In addition to the ministry of young people and women, she is very interested in the church's liturgical life. For the past few years, she has focused her studies on liturgical theology and history. She received her PhD in liturgical theology from Boston College and now teaches at her alma mater. Welcome, Teva. Well, good morning. Um, so I would like to begin my remarks with the second prayer of ordination of the female deacon in the Byzantine Rite. And I quote, Master and Lord, you do not reject women who offer themselves and by divine counsel to minister as fitting to your holy houses, but you accept them in the order of ministers. Give the grace of your Holy Spirit to this servant of yours also, who wishes to offer herself to you and to accomplish the grace of the diaconate, as you gave the grace of your diaconate to Phoebe, whom you called to the work of ministry. Grant her, O God, to preserve without condemnation in your holy churches, to give careful attention to her way of life, to chastity in particular, and show her to be your perfect servant. And when she stands before the judgment of Christ, she may also receive the fitting reward of her life." End quote. The female diaconate is a part of our history. For over a thousand years, the Orthodox Church ordained women to serve as deaconesses. And as the Orthodox theologian and author of Women Deacons in the Orthodox Church, Dr. Kiriaki Kadrivioyanis Fitzgerald writes, and I quote again, according to Byzantine liturgical texts, the ordination of the woman deacon occurred at any other, as any other ordination to major orders. It took place during the celebration of the Eucharist and at the same point in the service that the male deacon was ordained. She was ordained at the altar by the bishop and later in the service received Holy Communion at the altar with the other clergy. Depending upon the need, location, and situation in history, the deaconess ministered primarily to women in the community in much the same way as the male deacon ministered to men. The order was gradually de-emphasized sometime after the 12th century, but it should be noted that there does not exist any canon or church regulation that opposes or suppresses this order." Unquote. For over 100 years, various voices within the church have called upon for the restoration of the female diaconate. But what is the diaconate? What is its function in the life of the church and its relationship with the other ordained ministries? What did the female deacon do? We know some of the roles of the historical deaconess. Lay women today are filling many of these functions. So is it still necessary then to have an ordained ministry? Is a permanent diaconate, especially female diaconate, needed in the church today? These are some of the issues that surround this question. And although not exhaustive, my remarks will begin to explore them. 
I will end my presentation by addressing what I think is the most important question in this debate. How can reviving this ministry benefit the church? How can it build up the body of Christ for today? So the diaconate. Let me begin, much as Father Deacon John Kreese of Geese mentioned, with the fundamental assertion that there is only one ministry in the church, and that is Christ's ministry. And we are all called to participate in it. We are all, in fact, ordained to the ministry of Christ, the royal priesthood, and our baptism and chrismation. And it is here that we are anointed as priest, prophet, and king, participating in the life of the priest, prophet, and king. And within this royal priesthood within the second and third, during the second and third centuries, we see a threefold pattern of ministry that starts to emerge, what we now know as bishop, presbyter, and deacon. And this is, becomes the pattern of formal ordained ministry within the church. So how are these three expressions of priesthood, bishop, presbyter, and deacon, understood and how do they relate to one another? So according to the understanding of the church, the bishop or the episcopos is the overseer of the community. And as Deacon John reminded us, he is the center of the visible unity of the church and the spokesman for traditional doctrine. The priest or presbyter serves the local community. He is the minister of the word and sacrament. And it is through his hands that we offer our sacrifice of praise to God and from whose hands we encounter the peace of Christ at the liturgy. The deacons exemplify the interdependence of worship and service in the church's life. Historically, the diaconate has been a ministry that has focused on service and included pastoral care of the faithful, philanthropic outreach, reading of the scriptures, and sometimes preaching, and other forms of liturgical servants, such as preparing the offering of the people, leading the petitions of concerns of the people, taking communion to the sick, as well as ecclesiastical administration. In particular, it is grounded in the way that the church meets the world. So the diaconate in history, biblical times. The church's ministry, modeled after Christ's example, grew out of the needs of the community. In the early church, the Hellenists complained that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food, part of the philanthropic dimension ministry of the church. And the apostles realized that they could not attend to both the word of God and serving tables. So according to the count in Acts, they sought to, quote, sought out seven men of good standing, full of spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint to this task, unquote. And this has traditionally marked the embryonic beginning of the office of deacon. Later, the first place we find the word deacon, as George reminded us earlier today, was in the, as, as a title, was in Romans. St. Paul writes to the Romans and says, quote, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon, the Akinon, of the Church of Cancre, unquote. And although some have argued that this passage only refers to Phoebe as a helper, the writings of both Origen and St. John Chrysostom show that the patristic tradition upholds Phoebe's position as a deaconess. In addition, Chrysostom also understands the reference to women in St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, where he outlines the duties of bishop, presbyter, and deacon in the nascent church to refer to female deacons, not just women generally. He says that Paul is speaking of women who have, quote, the dignity and authority of the diaconate, unquote. The early church. We have evidence for the existence of deaconesses and deacons in the early church as well. In a secular text, one of the letters of Pliny, who was the governor of Bithynia, to Trajan in the year 112 AD, he asks for guidance on how to handle this Christian sect. And he writes that he had to place two women called deaconesses under torture. In addition, we have evidence of the existence of the male and female deacon and a general understanding of the functions of each from early church documents. We know that each was answerable to the bishop. And while the male deacons ministered primarily to men, the female deacons ministered mostly to women. Moreover, each also had a liturgical role, 
although the deaconess generally exercised this in a more private realm. This parallelism can be seen in a document called the Apostolic Constitutions, in a passage that outlines the character of the deacon. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this document, the Apostolic Constitutions is a fourth or fifth century document of Syrian origin that speaks to early church ethics and liturgics. So we know a little bit about the church, what was going on at the time through that particular document. And I quote, let the deacons be in all things unspotted, that the bishop himself is to be only more active, that they may minister to the infirm and let the deaconess be diligent in taking care of women, in other words, taking communion to her, but both of them ready to carry messages, to travel, to minister, and to serve, unquote. This reflects an earlier understanding of the functions of the office found in another text called the Didascalia Apostolorum, and this is about 100 years earlier, a later 3rd and 4th century, that deals with kind of pastoral and church practice at the time. Uh, the eight books of the Diascalia will then become part of the apostolic constitution. So it shows some uh, both continuity and also a change as in, the, in that 100-year interim. The Didascalia contains sections on the character of the deaconess and her ministry of assisting in the baptism of women and instruction of women converts. In addition, it contains sections for both the deacon and deaconesses, advising each to, ta- each to take care of the people in what we might call today pastoral care and to work closely with the bishop. The Byzantine period. During the Byzantine period, the diaconal office in the East, especially that of women, flourished. This can be seen by the number of women deacons on the liturgical calendar, including Saints Macrina, the sister of Gregory and Basil, on July 19th, Nona, the wife of Gregory of Nazianzus, on August 5th, Olympias, who we heard today, a close friend and confidant of St. John Chrysostom, on July 25th, Exenia the Merciful, on January 24th, Irene of, of um, Crisan Valantu on um, July 28th, and that's even later in uh, the 10th century, 9th, 10th century. In addition, we have descriptions of the makeup of the clergy serving the liturgy at Agia Sophia that, as we heard today, included 40 deaconesses. During this time, the male deacon, diaconate in the East also grew in prominence. They held high positions in church governance, including participating in the ecumenical councils, For instance, Athanasius of Alexandria, a deacon and secretary for the bishop, was at the Council of Nicaea in 325. They also served as emissaries and ambassadors of the Episcopal seat in diplomatic manners. Moreover, they were administrators of church-run homes to the poor and widows, orphanages, and hospitals. In general, the permanent diaconate in the West seems to have disappeared sometime between the 5th and 7th centuries. And although I could find no stated reason for this decline, the ministry of the various monastic orders in the West most likely supplanted that of the deacon. The female diaconate in particular had not been as widely accepted in the West as in the East. And unlike the East, where there no canons have ever suppressed the order, some local councils in the West actually prohibited it. And the First Council of Orange in 441 stated that, quote, any new deaconesses were absolutely not to be ordained, unquote. And in 533, in the Council of Orleans, virtually suppressed the order. However, it should be noted that at the Council of Orange also demanded clerical celibacy, and both of these councils are not recognized by the Orthodox Church as having ecumenical import. So the decline of the order in the East The order of the female diaconate began to decline in the East sometime after the 12th century. By this time, there were fewer adult baptisms, so female deacons were no longer needed at initiation. In addition, in late Byzantium, the rise of the influence of Levitical rules, especially those regarding women, led to the perception that the shedding of blood made a woman unclean and therefore unable to enter the sanctuary or participate in the liturgical life of the church. It should be noted that this is in direct contradiction to the understanding of uncleanness found in the early church documents that I just mentioned. For instance, the chapter 26 of the Didascalia admonishes Christians to abandon the rabbinical rules of uncleanness, and I quote, 
are they devoid of the Holy Spirit? For through baptism they receive the Holy Spirit, who is ever with those that work righteousness and does not depart from them for reason of natural issues and the intercourse of marriage, but is ever and always with those who possess him." Unquote. It goes on to explicitly state that the Holy Spirit remains with the women, woman during her monthly period, and that giving into rabbinical taboos and rules opens the way for what is quoted as the wrong spirit. The Apostolic Constitutions extends this emphasis, and I quote again, neither the lawful mixture, in other words, intercourse, nor childbearing, nor the menstrual purgation, nor nocturnal pollution can defile the nature of a person or separate them from the spirit of God, but only impiety towards God and transgression and injustice towards one's neighbor, unquote. It should be noted that the understanding of menstruation makes, that makes women unclean has been formally abrogated in some of our churches, for instance, the Church of Antioch, although it does remain in various degrees in other natural, national churches. With the rise of Islam and the subsequent fall of the eastern part of the Roman Empire to the Ottomans, the church turned inward. It could no longer participate in many of its philanthropic aspects of its ministry. Moreover, many of the traditional duties of the male deacon were being assumed by the priest and by a growing number of so-called minor orders. This led to the hallowing out of the position and it being perceived as more of a transitional one on the way to becoming ordained to the presbyterate. And although the male deacon retained his role in the liturgical assembly, the office had greatly de-evolved. And unfortunately, this is what typically remains in the order of the East today. So modern renewal of this office. In modern times, the diaconate has experienced a renewal and rejuvenation, most notably, and somewhat ironically, I might add, in Western Christian churches. And I explore this in a longer version of this talk, but uh, it's beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But I will say that in the Oriental East, the diaconate is being revived as well. According to a report from the Oriental Orthodox Roman Catholic Theological Consultation, how, held at St. Nearsus Armenian Seminary in 2003, Father Simeon Adabashian of the Armenian Church stated, and I quote, ancient societal roles of the deacons as being revived in the Armenian tradition, unquote. In addition to the central role they play in the liturgical services of the Armenian Church, their duties include training children and altar servers, and it should be noted that some Armenian churches now allow girls to serve in this capacity as well, visiting the sick and taking on responsibilities of parish administration, unquote. The ordination of the female deacon is also part of the history of the Armenian church and is also being revived. According to the report from the Discerning of the Times Conference for Orthodox Women held in Istanbul in 1997, his, his beatitude, Patriarch Karakin II, mentioned that the Armenian church, quote, had taken the initiative in ordaining women to the order of diaconate, an order in which both men and women were ordained and performed similar functions." Unquote. At this same meeting, it is reported that Archbishop Mezrab Matafian, the Patriarchal Vicar for Ecumenical Relations, spoke of the traditional practice of the Armenian Church to ordain women to the diaconate. And the consultation report goes on to say, and I quote, "'There is no difference between the ordination service for women and men. Women deacons care for the orphans, assist women at baptism, serve liturgically at the altar, read the gospel, and bring the host to the priest. At this time, women deacons came from the monastic tradition. However, it should be noted that in the Armenian church in Iran last year, ordained a single woman to the diaconate um, with the desire that if she so desired that she could get married in the future, as is the custom in the, in the Armenian church. In other words, they don't have to be married. If they would like to be married, they don't need to be prior to being ordained to the diaconate, but they do for the male candidates prior to being ordained to the presbytery. In the Byzantine East, especially in the United States, the male diaconate is growing. Training programs have been established to train candidates. And in some places, male deacons are assuming more responsibility for pastoral care and the philanthropic work of the community. However, 
In other places, the ministry is still exercised as either an interim step prior to ordination to the presbytery or solely as a liturgical functionary. And the female diaconate has not as yet been revived. There have been numerous attempts for over 100 years to reinstate the female diaconate in the Orthodox Church. And here I'd like to, to direct you to one of the handouts that I mentioned in, when I first started my presentation to see the calls for the rejuvenation of the female diaconate in the modern era. As early as 1855, the sister of Tsar Nicholas I tried to restore the office. Other prominent Russians also lobbied for its restoration, including Alexander Gamalevsky and Mother Catherine, or the Countess of Amofsky. According to numerous sources, in 1905 and 06, several bishops, archbishops, and metropolitans of the Russian Orthodox Church encouraged this effort. According to the report of the Consultation of Orthodox Women in Agapia in 1976, this issue was to be a major topic in the Council of the Russian Church beginning in 1917, but as George mentioned this morning, due to the political turmoil of Russia at the time, the Council's work was not addressed. Other efforts were made in Greece. On Pentecost Sunday in 1911, Archbishop, now St. Nectarios, ordained a nun to the diaconate to serve the needs of her monastery, and in particular, to serve in the liturgy by reading the gospel, saying petitions, and distributing communion. More recently, the issue has been discussed at a number of international conferences. The first of these conferences was held primarily for Orthodox women in Agapia, Romania in 1976, where the restoration of the female diaconate was unanimously recommended. This was followed by a meeting in Sofia, Bulgaria in 1987 that continued to urge serious consideration of the issue. And then in 1988, the most substantive gathering to discuss the ordination of women was held in Rhodes, Greece. This conference was called by the ecumenical patriarch, Demetrius I, as part of the pre-conciliar work at what was to then to have been called the Great and Holy Council of the Orthodox Church. It was attended by approximately 70 people and included official church delegates, including many bishops and priests, and expert advisors from the Eastern Orthodox churches from all over the world, with the um, small exception of the patriarchs at that time of Antioch and Jerusalem. It was organized, originally organized, to respond to the challenge posed by the Orthodox Church, posed to the Orthodox Churches by our ecumenical partners who had begun, begun ordaining women to the ministry and strove to articulate an Orthodox response to this question. And while the consultation was not in favor of ordaining women to the presbytery, or the episcopacy for that matter, it did say, state that, I quote, the order of deaconess should be revived, unquote. The consultation concluded that there was ample evidence for this ministry from apostolic times well into the Byzantine period, and that that deaconess was ordained in what they call in Greek herotonia to a higher orders, and that such a revival would, quote, represent a positive response to the many needs and demands of the contemporary world, unquote. Furthermore, the report suggested the possibility of open up the so-called lower orders to women, for instance, subdeacon, tonsured reader, altar server, etc. The consultation at Rhodes was a pivotal event. It represents the first international Orthodox consensus on the revival of the female diaconate in the modern period. And it is from this consensus upon all which all subsequent conferences examining the issue have been based. So this essentially is the mind of the church in which we are helping to continually flesh out. Since that time, additional conferences have been, have been held at Crete in 1990, Damascus, Syria in 1996, and Istanbul 1997, in which this issue has been both discussed and affirmed. Furthermore, in July of 2000, after a year of careful study on the subject, a formal letter was sent to the ecumenical patriarch, this time Bartholomew, by more than a dozen members of the Orthodox community in Paris, including such noted Orthodox theologians as Elizabeth Bersigel, Father Boris, Boris Brobenskoy, Olivier Clement, and Nicholas Lasky. The letter stresses that the history of the female diaconate and notes that the patriarch himself has stated, quote, that there is no obstacle in canon law 
that stands in the way of the ordination to the women of, to the diaconate, unquote. And this is notable primarily because Patriarch um, Bartholomew was a canonist. That was his area of study. So he cited, and he knows the canons very well. So this institution of the early church de deserves to be revitalized. That finishes his quote. It also states that, in, that the order should, quote, involve more than a simple and archaeological reconstruction, reconstitution of the ancient ministry of the deaconess. It is a question of revitalization. In other words, of the realization in the context and of the culture and the requirements for the present day, unquote. Finally, a major conference entitled Deaconesses, Ordination of Women and Orthodox Theology, unquote, was held in January of 19, er, 2015 in Thessaloniki, Greece. It explored the issue of the female diaconate thoroughly from biblical, liturgical, patristic, systematic, canonical, and historical theology. So what are the issues in this debate? Historically, the first issue that was in question was whether the deaconess was actually ordained, rather hierothenia, or whether she was something more akin to the subdeacon, in which is called in Greek technically, the technical term is hierothesia. In the listing of the church orders and church manuals, as well as in the reception of communion, the female deacon usually follows the male deacon, but is listed before the subdeacon, thus the confusion. Is she part of the subdeacon or is she part of the actual diaconate? But in 1954, in a landmark study by Evangelos Theodorou from Greece, E uh, Hierotonia, E Hierothesia, Ton Diaconison, or the ordination or appointment of deaconesses, pretty much conclusively answered that question. As I, as I mentioned in the beginning of my remarks, his work showed that her ordination took place during the Eucharistic celebration or the divine liturgy, not before the service, as we, when then we bless the minor orders. It took place at the same place in the service as the male deacon was ordained. It included two prayers, which is what we have for major orders versus one prayer for minor orders, and in the case of minor orders, and one of which was called you know, upon divine, God's divine grace, which is only done for the major orders. She was ordained at the altar by the bishop, received the orarion or the stole, and later received Holy Communion at the altar with the other clergy. All of these are marks of higher order of clergy. And although there are still people who quibble with some very small differences in the ordination between a male and female deacon, for instance, the referencing of Phoebe versus Stephan, and whether the female deacon is standing or kneeling at a particular point, for almost all scholars, the work of Theodora was definitive. The second major issue in question is whether once admitted to the diaconate, women will necessarily be admitted to the presbytery, in other words, the slippery slope fair. And this is still a concern for some, especially, although not exclusively, to those who have entered the church primarily because their former faith traditions have moved in this direction. However, I would argue that the, this concern implicitly does not recognize the diaconate as its own ministry, with its own charism. It also neglects the history of the church, where women served for over a thousand years without moving up. Still, we have to admit that the church, that this question is real. The canonical corpus of the church does not require that a candidate be male, only that he be baptized and not a neophyte. And interestingly, we sometimes ignore that later requirement. But now this is not to say that it is not assumed that the candidate would, not, would be a man, and the canonical corpus and the culture of the time certainly supports this. More recently, some theologians have tried to articulate what is called a male character to the priesthood. However, the church has yet to definitively decide the question via an ecumenical council. <clears throat> It is true that a revived female diaconate will most likely bring this question to the forefront. The church will then have to grapple with it, and hopefully on its own terms. Ironically, those who oppose the female diaconate because they fear it will automatically lead to the female priests implicitly acknowledged that there is no inherent male character to the priesthood. Still, this is not a question about the diaconate itself. 
And given the state of orthodox polity, I do not think it is, it is an immediate issue. The need. So does the Orthodox Church really need a rejuvenated diaconate, and in particular, a restored female diaconate? This has been a question posited by some. And to help answer this question, it is instructive to understand the responsibilities of a typical parish priest. Father Alexander Garkovs outlined a number of functions expected of today's parish priest in his presentation at a pastoral conference held at St. Tecon's Monastery in June of 2004. So in addition to all the liturgical duties of a priest, the Sunday and any daily liturgies, feast days, baptisms, weddings, funerals, etc., he enumerates some of the priest's responsibilities in parish life in America today. And I'll go through these rather quickly. He says, pastoral visitations, educational work, Bible study, adult study, youth work, teen work, working with choirs, choir directors, marriage preparation, marriage counseling, visiting shut-ins, grief counseling, hospital visits, office works, preparing printing bulletins, schedules, parish merit mailings, parish council meetings, PR building committees, sunshine committees, etc. So it is clear that the modern day job description of the priest can be overly broad. In addition, it includes functions that have actually traditionally been the responsibility of deacons. Priests who try to do it all will most likely not be able to do everything well and will soon suffer from severe burnout and not be able to help anyone. Moreover, as far back as 1953, Archbishop Michael of the Greek Orthodox Church, which was then North and South America, realized that there was so much to do in each community that, and I quote, endeavors of these priests alone do not suffice. For should a priest which wish to know, as he must, his spiritual children by name, their problems and their spiritual and moral needs, this would certainly beyond, be beyond his physical and spiritual resources, unquote. Clearly, a rejuvenated diaconate a ministry that has service as its primary focus is necessary in the church today. In 1990, the consultation held in Crete, which I mentioned earlier, also emphasized the need for a fully functioning diaconate of and for both men and women. Furthermore, it fleshed out the ways in which such a ministry could benefit the church. According to the report, the, consult, the delegates emphasized, and I quote, there is an urgent need for the renewal of women's ministries, particularly that of the diaconate. The presence of the deacon or deaconess could lead people in prayer, give spiritual counsel, help distribute Holy Communion when possible or necessary. The revival of the diaconate for both men and women would meet many of the needs of the church in a changing world, catechetical work, pastoral relations, serving the same needs for monastic communities without a presbyter reading prayers for special occasions, performing social work, pastoral care, engaging in youth and college ministry, counseling, anointing the infirm, carrying out missionary work, ministering to the sick, assisting the bishop or presbyter in the liturgical services. And it concludes by saying, a creative restoration of the diaconate for women, we hope, will lead in turn to the renewal of the diaconate for men. End quote. No one person can fulfill all the duties necessary for the building up of Christ. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, quote, each of us has been given the manifestation of the, good, of the, of the Spirit for the common good, unquote. In particular, I suggest the female diaconate is needed to be able to serve fully all of the faithful. For instance, there is still a need for ministry of women to women especially surrounding issues of reproduction, intimacy, and abuse. Furthermore, the church could and should avail itself to the talents and gifts of one half of the faithful for the building up of the, of the body. So what does it mean to be ordained? Today, many lay women and men serve diaconal ways as chaplains, spiritual directors, chanters, readers, homilists, philanthropic outreach coordinators, and parish administrators. In addition, they are often mis missionaries and Christian educators, just to name a few of the many di diaconal ministries in which they are actively participating. However, however, today, they do so without an ordination. So the issue for some is, as we heard the question earlier, why should they be ordained? 
In order to begin to answer this question, we must first acknowledge that the ministry of the laity is important, and we should not minimize it. Still, we do ordain people in our church, and what does this mean? In general, it is a setting aside for someone for ministry, usually a particular function within the church. And unlike Roman Catholic theology, we do not believe in an ont- what's called an ontological change at ordination. And unlike most Protestant theology, it is not just a functional designation. According to Metropolitan John Zizioulis, one of the foremost theologians of our day, it is establishing a new relationship with the community. So an ordination sets one aside for the ministry and develops a new relationship within the community. It assumes that the ordained are trained to do said ministry, for instance, spending years in seminary, learning about the faith and how to minister more properly. It also sets up a reciprocal relationship between the church and the ordained. The ordained carries the authority and the support of the church, but then they are also held accountable to her through the bishop. In other words, there are no loose wheels. You can't just say anything. You're a representative from the church. Their gifts are enlivened by the descent of the Spirit during the ordination in the Eucharistic celebration, and their ministry is tied to the Eucharist as its source and summit. In other words, they connect people to the sacramental life of the church. They bring communion to the sick. They anoint. They allow people to experience the power of that. So what could an ordained female diaconate offer the church? The most salient question that I think is operative in this debate, and when all is said and done, is how can the diaconal work that women, and men for that matter, are already doing in the church be enhanced by an ordination? What would this mean for the building up of the church? And I would like to offer four ways in which a fully functioning diaconate could benefit the church. First, by strengthening the pastoral care of the faithful and enhancing this care through the sacramental life of the church. Second, by recapturing the philanthropic dimension of liturgy. Third, by focusing on the word of God, more particularly. And fourth, by connecting the pastoral, social, and liturgical dimensions of the diaconate more fully. So first, strengthening the, strengthening the pastoral care of the faithful. If I, as I have mentioned earlier today, women are serving as chaplains in hospitals, hospitals, hospices, and other settings. They bring solace to the sick and dying through their prayers and words of comfort. However, their lay status prevents them from offering holy communion or perhaps unction to the faithful. As a deaconess, a chaplain could connect the ill or infirmed to the power of the sacramental life of the church. As a representative of the church, she could also bring the thoughts and prayers of the entire assembly to those in need. Furthermore, through petition in the gathered assembly, she could bring the concerns of those in need to the attention of the faithful for prayer. This connects the sick and dying to the community and the community to the sick and dying in ways that are tangible and of life-affirming and strengthens the unity of the body of Christ. I have seen a need for this type of ministry in my own experience. When I was in seminary, I spent six weeks one summer at a nursing home with many Orthodox residents for my pastoral care residency. I had nine women and one man on my rounds, and as typically the case, women tend to outnumber men in those law settings. We tend to live longer. As a representative from from the seminary, I had some authority for my visits. They weren't just social visits, important as those may be. I got along well with the residents, and as my visits continued, I found out that many of them wanted to talk. And they wanted to talk about important things in their lives. And for many women, kind of women-type things, reproductive issues, loss of a child, problems they may have had with their husbands, things that they might never discuss or at least not feel comfortable discussing with a man. They also wanted to talk about more general concerns, if they had something that was unsettled in their lives, regrets that they might have had, or what might lie ahead of them 
when they leave this world. And frankly, I took a lot of confessions. In general, I felt quite a bit over my head, not having received much training in this area. But I also felt that our encounters would have been enhanced if I had been able to bring to them the healing power of Christ through the sacraments of the church. And likewise, I would suggest that they might have felt more comforted knowing that through my intercession, a community was praying and caring for them as well. Both of these actions would more concretely manifest to them that healing in Christ is healing of mind, body, and soul, both personal and communal. Some residents had been in the nursing home for years, others for only a short time. However, I was quite saddened to learn that none of them, none, had a pastoral visit by their parish priest or deacon in all the time that they were there. And unfortunately, this was not the exception to the rule. It wasn't only my rounds of people who had experienced this. Clearly, there is a need for women to engage in this type of ministry in the church. Similarly, a spiritual director can provide pastoral care to many in need of guidance in their lives. Although the faithful would still receive absolution for remission of their sins through the agency of a priest, those engaged in spiritual direction can benefit from a relationship with a trained director to help them reflect on their lives. This guidance can help them understand ourselves better in order to be able to to see our sins more clearly and open a path for repentance and growth. Additionally, it can help us move forward with our lives and grow in relationship with God, both individually and in community, in ways that are healthy and life-affirming. In the ecclesial realm, many seek guidance in the monastic context. But not all monastics are good spiritual directors by virtue of their monastic vows. And to be quite honest, some advice they have given can be quite dubious and damaging to those who seek it. Anecdotal evidence suggests that women particularly have been the recipient of such advice and on occasion abuse. The church could benefit from from those women who are immersed in the spiritual life of the church, whether inside or outside the monastic context, who are also trained in psychology and orthodox anthropology in order to minister more fully to those in its care. An ordination would emphasize the reciprocal relationship of this ministry, Those trained and ordained in this ministry have the authority and support of the church, but they also have the responsibility to the church and are accountable to her. In other words, there are no loose wheels. Furthermore, an ordained deaconess could provide pastoral care as an intercessor between clergy and hierarchy and the laity for those in need of their efforts. She could be an official but neutral observer or moderator for private conversation to guard against abuse or false charges of the same, protecting both parties in the conversation, both the clergy and the laity. And in the wake of the sexual scandals that have affected various quarters of the Christian church, to which the Orthodox Church has not been totally immune, such a person can protect all involved. Recapturing the philanthropic dimension of liturgy. A rejuvenated diaconate can recapture this dimension of liturgy, more particularly by connecting our service to God with a service to our neighbor. Justin the Martyr reports that in the early church, all Christians contributed to the offering, each one depositing their contribution with the president of the assembly. The president would then take these offerings to take care of, quote, the orphans and widows and those who are needy because of sickness and other cause, and the captives and the strangers who sojourn among us. In the east, the gifts were faithful were deposited at what we call the Skevophilakian, or the outer area, prior to the celebration of the liturgy. The deacons would then select a portion to be offered to God and carry to the altar area at the beginning of the liturgy of the faithful, what we now call the great entrance. The remaining gifts would be blessed and then distributed to the poor, the orphans, the widows, anyone in need. And this was the responsibility of the bishop and usually done by the deacon or deaconess as an agent of the bishop. A fully functioning diaconate would help to connect our liturgy and our service to the world more fully. 
focusing on the Word of God. The diaconate is a ministry closely associated with the Word of God, proclaiming it in word and song. In particular, the church could benefit greatly from those who study the scriptures more particularly and use their education to help to edify the lives of those assembled. And although preaching is also an area of ministry in which some theologically trained laypersons participate, it can be controversial in some places, especially when a woman is doing it. Even in these contexts, whereas, whereas an expansion of this ministry has been welcomed, the arrival of a new priest with a different understanding of who can and cannot participate in this ministry, or a complaint from a disgruntled parishioner can often trump the wishes of the silent majority and cause the person who had been participating in this ministry to be disallowed from doing so. The congregation is then deprived of hearing their voice and the perspective they bring to the reading. As a deacon or deaconess, this would be an inherent part of their ministry. Now, this doesn't mean that they would assume or take on all the preaching duties, but it would allow another voice and a studied perspective to contribute more regularly to the edification of the faithful. And last, connecting the pastoral, social, and liturgical dimensions of the diaconate more fully. As I have mentioned above, the ministry of the deacon is to connect more fully the pastoral and social dimensions of Christ's work in the world and in and through the gathering of the assembly. He is the connection between the world and our cultic celebration. And I have intimated how a future deaconess can continue to strengthen this connection as well. However, a formal and public liturgical role is the least developed area of diaconal work for women, as most of her ministry in antiquity, as well as most of her life, was exercised in a more private sphere. This is another concern for those opposed to the revitalization of the female diaconate. However, as Deacon John Kreese of Geese, the deacon we heard earlier for the ecumenical patriarch, reminds us, and I quote, the decision as whether or not women deacons perform public liturgical functions arguably remains the exclusive prerogative of bishops and synod in order that the Catholic mind of the church may gradually mature in and collectively seal this critical aspect of the female diaconate. Unquote. In my opinion, it is, a, it is a distortion of the office to have the male deacon serve only in the liturgy and not in the community, and conversely to have a female, future female deacon serve within the community but not in the liturgy. As Dr. Fitzgerald reminds us, quote, it is important to remember that in the past women deacons did have important liturgical responsibilities. In the Eucharist, as well as administering in baptism, in praying with and for those in need, and in bringing communion to those unable to attend the celebration. Today, these expressions of ministry can certainly continue. At the same time, we need to examine how women deacons can participate in the Eucharist and other liturgical services in a manner which is expressive of the living tradition of the church and which is not defined by cultural norms of another time." Unquote. In conclusion, the diaconate is a ministry of service that connects our communal gathering with the liturgy of our lives more particularly. In the divine liturgy, we offer our sacrifice of praise to God, and we encounter the joy and peace of the Trinity more fully. As we leave our communal gathering, we continue to share this joy with others, ministering to our neighbor. And when we assemble again as the body of Christ, we bring our encounter with our neighbor, with us. And our task is to continue this dance, drawing all of life into Christ, equipping and recognizing the diaconal ministry of women and men can help to strengthen our mission for the building up of the body and for the life of the world. Thank you.